Hello. Hey, Gary. Hey, everybody. Greetings from me and my monkey. Oh, hey, monkey. Everybody's, you, everybody's got something to hide except for me and my uh, monkey. No, I got stuff all over. How, I, I, you know, this is our uh, fifth week, and uh, it's getting, I don't know if not better, but certainly more exciting. Um, it's something I always look forward to, and in talking with the Deadhead community, people seem to be uh, digging Friday nights in the dead world, considering where we're at. It's amazing how this community has gathered around the digital hearth. And uh, it's kind of like being at a show together. Of course, it isn't quite as good, isn't quite as sweaty. Uh, but it's really got that feeling. It's got that communal vibe to it. The response from people has been incredible, both in the comments we've been getting, the live chat that's going on there on the YouTube screen, and also the incredibly generous donations that people have made to the various good causes we've been supporting. And let's talk about that for a second. Indeed, this is, uh, we're going back to uh, Music Cares. And, you know, as Gary says, uh, we've been raising a lot of money for a lot of different causes. So we want to thank you really immensely. I think we've raised cumulatively over $50,000 in the last four weeks. And tonight will be a big one. Music Cares, um, as we know, uh, a lot of our friends in the music world, uh, musicians and their crews. And a lot of my friends, and I know a lot of Gary's friends, and I, I these are some of my best friends in the world. Um, the, the Dead and Company crew and all the, so many bands and their crews and Music Cares is there to help. And tonight we have a very special thing going on where Spotify is going to match every dollar you give. So, you know, if you give a dollar, they'll match it. You get two in, if you can give 20 bucks, we'll get 40. So anything you can do is a huge help with Music Cares. So this is um, this has been big. We, we really do appreciate it. Right, and we should mention also that Spotify is also partnering with our friends at Dead & Company, who have been doing a regular series every Saturday, mm -hmm. called appropriately One More Saturday Night, where they have been showing some great live Dead & Company videos. And tomorrow night, Spotify will be offering the same thing when they show Dead & Company's show, a great one from New Orleans on February 24th, 2018. This was the resumption of the end of their tour after John Mayer had appendicitis yep. uh, the previous December. Yep. The band came back triumphantly to New Orleans. Uh, I think some deadheads had never left New Orleans. They just stuck around because why not if you're in New Orleans? Uh, and the dead played a tremendous show with the great George Porter Jr. sitting in for a yep. few tunes. So that's a must watch too. And Spotify will be doing the same deal, matching every dollar mm -hmm. donated uh, and giving it to tomorrow night the New Orleans Jazz and Heritage Foundation, which was our beneficiary uh, last weekend, I believe it was. Yeah. So anyway, please support both great causes. Once again, as we stress every time, if everybody watching tonight just kicks in a couple of dollars, yeah. two, three, four, five dollars, and Spotify matches that, that's going to be a tremendous amount of money. If you can afford to give more, I know these are tough times for everybody. But if you can afford to give more, Spotify is going to match uh, up to something like $10 million in donations. Yeah, so, you know, if you can give $5 million tonight, Spotify would be happy to match. And they're doing, like we say, they're doing it again tomorrow right. with Dead & Company. Dead & Company is at uh, 5 p.m. tomorrow, West Coast, 8 p.m. on the East Coast. So it's it's going to be, a, it's a great weekend. All the weekends are really fun now. Yes, indeed. But, hey, this is a big night for us. The biggest. We've got a great live Grateful Dead to sh show to show you at the end of this. But before that, we've got a very special guest in waiting. And if all goes well, he's going to turn up right now. Right there or there. Okay. Hey, all there right. it is. Except I got to put the, put you on the uh, on my major screen here. On my big okay. Screen. You got all it? Right. Mr. 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 Bob Weir. Hey, Bob. Hi. Good to have you. You're looking well, hale and hearty. Except I'm not seeing you all. Okay, hang on. Okay. Oh, I'll get this sorted out. All right. There we are. Okay. You got us? Yeah. All right. All right. As I was saying, you're looking well. Why, thanks. Looks like you're taking good care of yourself in confinement. Oh, but of course. <laughs> well, you know, this is a time where you'd be um, getting ready. Well, there was the Wolf Brothers tour, and then you'd be getting ready for Dead & Company. How how are you doing, and how are you keeping busy for a guy who's on the road so much? I'm keeping way busy. In fact, busier than I care to be. Um, 
that said, you know, it's all good stuff. As you, you know, you wait all your life to get to the stuff that you really want to get to, and then it all comes at once. And uh, and that's kind of where I am right now. Uh, you know, I'm working on a book. I'm working on an uh, orchestral project, a rather large one, working on an opera. Um, and uh, I got a couple of bands in mothballs right now. Mm-hmm. And um, what else am I? not getting to here well yeah and and, uh, and i've been whiling away the hours getting into photoshop and 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 doing sort of uh i guess what you call graphic art right and uh so you know <laughs> i'm busy yeah Good. not no. gathering not gathering any dust nah hell no but uh let's talk about the impact of this uh unprecedented thing uh, for all of us, the music lovers who want to come to the shows, the bands, uh, the crews of the bands. This has all had just a seismic effect on pretty much everything we've been doing for much of our lives. And that's why we are addressing this by supporting Music Cares tonight. I I should explain my choice of wardrobe tonight. Uh, (laughs) This this is our dear departed, but never really departed friend, Chris Chiruki saluting the world as only he can. And I wore this specifically because I've been thinking a lot about the guys who do jobs like this. Chris Shiruki was longtime stage manager for Rat Dog and for Further and for Dead and Company, worked in the business for years in San Francisco. Uh, And he was emblematic of the people who were being hit by this thing, the people who make their living supporting bands, making the shows happening, making the stage safe for the musicians, all of that stuff. And so we're thinking about those people a lot right now, and Music Cares, their COVID-19 fund, is very specifically addressing not just the musicians who are hurting financially, but all the support workers, the people who work at the venues, all that need our help right now. Mm-hmm. You know, well, past a certain level, I don't think, you know, a certain, a certain level of popularity and stuff like that, I, I'm not sure that... Uh, Many of the, mus- the of the musicians are gonna hurt all that badly. Right. You know, I'm, I'm not making money right now. I'm, I'm not gonna make money in the in the near future. But uh, you know, I'll be okay. But a lot of the uh, a lot of the crew guys are you know they're they're working stiffs basically. Um, they they go from job they they, they exist from job to job and uh, and you know the musicians can afford to carry some of the load of keeping those guys afloat but past a certain past a certain point it becomes you know if you if you have a big crew and a lot of bands have big crews um past a certain past a certain point it, it it's unsustainable for uh for uh for the musicians to uh for the for the artists to uh to to try to support those guys and you know they got families themselves and all that kind of stuff and uh music cares can can really can help there a bunch and uh, and generous contributions from uh, from the from the general folks out there listening or watching indeed and once again if you're watching right now and you are logged into the grateful dead channel on youtube there's a blue button on the screen there, uh, probably to the right of the screen, or if you're on a mobile device, it might be somewhere else, but it's a blue button, and it says donate. I'm not seeing it. But it's, well, no, you're on a different screen, Bobby. <laughs> so, uh, uh, anyway, uh, this is what the public is seeing, and if you hit that button, it's the easiest thing in the world. Yeah. Your, your info will pop up. If you're registered on YouTube, they might already have your credit card info and all that stuff. Mm-hmm. It's just a few easy steps, and you can donate a little bit or a lot, whatever you've got. And as we said, Spotify is matching that. So we can take in a whole lot of money, not just for this. There are struggling musicians. Bobby said appropriately, no. the, the more wealthy musicians, the better, the better off musicians can get by more easily. But there are a lot of musicians who their livelihood absolutely depends on their being out there playing one nighters every night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so so they will be helped. The crews will be helped. The people who work at venues the whole infrastructure of the music business, which is thousands and thousands of people out there um, is going to benefit from this. And maybe it'll help us all appreciate those people more when we get back to work. 
Mm -hmm. those, those folks would would be willing frontline folks if uh, if uh, if uh, if it made sense, but it doesn't. Indeed, these yeah, are, they these are good people. These are you know, and the Grateful Dead is. I think people know from the dad's history that they've always treated their crew like family because they are, they're good people. They're really remarkably good people. And, you know, I think of, you know, Shiruki was one of them. AJ is certainly one of them. And all these people are some of my best friends. And um, yeah, now is the time to help everybody out, help some good people. So we really do appreciate it. Right. They're, they're your family too, folks. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Just as the audience for the Grateful Dead were never just customers. They were part of a community. That's true of the crew and all the support workers as well. So, Bobby, there's plenty to talk about. Uh, <laughs> we've got uh, questions from the audience. Uh, we probably got some questions of our own. Uh, you filled us in on a lot of what you're doing. I mean, it's an amazing, amazing bunch of stuff you're taking on between the book and opera, symphonic work. Um, have you been thinking about ways to make music uh, <laughs> in these conditions? Well, one of the things I've been up to, um, uh, sort of feverishly, uh, trying to put together, and, and you, we're going to get it together in just a few days, just in time for people uh, for the governments to start re relaxing the uh, <laughs> shelter in place uh, um, stipulations. But uh, one of the, one of the things that I've been working on is is uh, we're trying to get. Uh, Get it so that people can play together live on on over the internet, and you see these uh, these 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 streams that come out where uh, people are, look look like they're playing live, but they're not. You know, it's done one one part of the time, and then it's all stitched together. Um, what we're trying to do is get it so that you actually can play together over the internet. You have to uh, you have to overcome latencies that are introduced uh, here and there and everywhere. You go uh, on the on the internet. You know, you go to the server station. There's a latency that's induced there. Latency that's induced by your home Wi-Fi. So you have to go straight into the straight into the wall with a wire. All that kind of stuff. Um, and we're almost there. I was playing with uh, I was playing with Jay Lane, and uh, and he's in the city, and I'm out at Stinson Beach. And I was playing with him uh, last night, and we were playing together. We could do it. Uh, we had a bass player we were playing with um, uh, down in uh, San Diego, and that's a little too far away. And every time you go through a ser uh, you know, a, a, a server station, uh, they introduce a little more latency. And by the time the sound got back to us, uh, he was out of time with us. And he's a good bass player, and uh, but. Uh, and you, you can hear what he's playing is good stuff, but it's not in time with us. And so, uh, so that wasn't working. So we're going to, but we're almost there. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, until, until, you know, we, we may have this going in a couple of days and, uh, at which point, at which point I think, uh, what we're going to want to do is, uh, is, uh, Wolf Bros is going to, is going to finish, finish up the tour that we had to cut short we had to shut down and um and uh, that'll be fun yeah well i'm really intrigued to see how how you're able to pull this off i guess if you do something more in the uh the free improv realm you can probably get away with more of the latencies or 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 just pretend you're back at the acid test where it didn't matter if anything was happening simultaneously <laughs> Yeah, but if you want to play something rhythmic and stuff like sure. that, you, you can't do that if there's if there's you know if there's substantial latency. Sure. Well, you know, one thing that that we, we were at, well, you know, we usually kind of get to questions later, and we will get to more questions. And one thing has come up in many of our questions. Um, a lot of them relate to TRI. And, you know, five, six, seven years ago when TRI was very, very active with the, li the, the live streaming of concerts, is there any chance that concerts could be broadcast from TRI, whether it's Wolf Brothers or Dead & Company, whoever it is? It could be you. It could be anybody. That's the next step. Um, once, once, they relax, once they relax the shelter-in-place stuff mm -hmm. to the point where, uh, you know, here in California, it's still pretty tight. Mm -hmm. uh, tomorrow, I think we go into phase one of the uh, relaxing of the standards, but uh, but still, it's going to be a while before people can congregate. 
And so um, then the next move on the board, once we can get together in, in, in small groups, you know, adequately spaced and all that kind of sp stuff, then uh, then we go into TRI and we start uh, we start doing that kind of thing. And maybe we bring in a guest or two and uh, let, letting other folks use the facility because it's basically it's a flying saucer just idling on the tarmac. And, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, we, you know, we were a few years ahead of of the curve and it was kind of useless at the time, but now it's, it's, it looks like it's going to become kind of useful. Yeah, if there can be said to be a silver lining to the way this is affecting all of us, I think it's brought out a lot of real creative thinking in people, mm -hmm. you, know, you know, coming up with great schemes to be creative without the customary format. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Well, we, we used to love TRI shows, so we look forward to when, uh, when it's safe for people to go back. We'll be tuning into that as well. That'll be uh, another Tuesday night, maybe, or something. <laughs> yeah, the nights are pretty full. Every yeah. a, lo a lot of bands have these things going up. I think it's a great way to keep these communities together. Yeah. So, uh, you know, tonight's show that we're going to be showing, the Grateful Dead show from uh, 31 years ago, a little shade under, the yeah, 31 years ago, July, from Foxborough. Um, you know, it reminded me when we scheduled this as our concert tonight and, and scheduled you as our guest and we thank you and Matt and Red and Bernie for making this happen. Um, it re I was reminded when you were rehearsing a lot with Rat Dog and the other ones when Alfonso was that tour. I remember you would ask me often to make uh, CDs for the band members to learn Grateful Dead songs, so songs you wanted to introduce to the Rat Dog set or whatever. And you would very specifically ask me for stuff from summer 1989. And, you know, your memory is clearly very good, but that tour in particular clearly struck you as uh, as memorable. And that was, you know, 20 years ago where yeah. you were talking about that tour, this tour we're gonna show tonight. Do you remember what it was about that tour or, or your feeling and why the, those were the versions? You'd say, get me a Ramble on Rose, make sure it's summer 89. And you just had a really high feelings about that. There were a lot of things that were working in our favor at that point. Our, our vocal blend was real good. Mm -hmm. The onstage dynamics, we we'd somehow managed to get quiet enough on stage that we could hear our, hear the vocals uh, on stage. And that's mm -hmm. a big important thing if you want to get the singing into it. And, um, and all that came together. And at the same time, uh, we had spent enough time working with that particular ensemble, friend in the band. Uh, uh, everybody was, everybody was real fluid with each other, mm -hmm. and uh, so there was, you know, and and Jerry was in good shape, mm -hmm. and uh, and so there was just there was a lot of or, or, there was a lot of crosstown traffic going on, and uh, and and. It was just I, I remember it as being as uh, as being one of our uh, our halcyon moments or halcyon eras, I guess. Yeah, you know, felt that way. Yeah, really. Uh, it. I've often thought it was the closest you guys ever got to really sounding like a stadium rock act, but of course you didn't. Also, because you would go way off into the woods. <laughs> you know, you would you would dissolve song structure. You would get really subtle. So you didn't have the cliche aspect of stadium rock, but you had the power and the coherency. Yeah, we had some punch. You did. And I just, what I felt in the stadiums is Gary saying that I never felt a lack of, of intimacy. And, and, you know, it's a big stadium, Foxborough, but the dynamics of a Grateful Dead song where you get really quiet and low and, and you could feel it and then blow it up and it would just the the dynamics were never lost and you know it's not a theater it's certainly not a little indoor theater it's a big outdoor stadium and i still felt that you know even though i'm sitting way over there on the 50 yard line i could still feel that you know there was a, some power to it that um i just felt like nothing was lost even though it's in a stadium and that's a credit to you guys and, and like you say everything else going on whether it was the sound and the lights and the, the stage set it was just an amazing time well, you know, no matter where you're playing, if you can feel the whole place, if you can feel those back rows and all that kind of stuff, whether it be a club or a living room or a stadium, you know, if you can feel the whole room, you can you can be intimate with them, and uh, it doesn't really matter. 
Uh, you know, you have to take into consideration maybe the, the, the acoustics of the place. The, uh, the acoustics in a stadium are, are going to be different than the acoustics in a living room. Um, but that said, once you get a feel for that, and, you know, practice makes perfect. We got, uh, we got plenty of practice at it. Uh, once you get a feel for that, then, uh, then it's just a matter of, is it going to be a good night? Are you is everybody, everybody going to be awakened there? Yeah, it also speaks to something that was a preoccupation of the Grateful Dead from the very beginning, which was that as you moved from little bars into theaters, into arenas, into stadiums, you always took the time to do the research and development into making the technology better, you know, making the music get to the people with more clarity and allow those subtleties to be heard. You know, Derek Featherstone's been doing mm-hmm. a tremendous job of that with Dead & Company, and that's... The, that aspect of things has always been part of the story. Mm-hmm. Yep. You know, I'm, I'm seeing numbers uh, fly by and I just want to uh, chime in that um, the donations tonight are, uh, I think for our, our, our shakedown stream record setting. Thanks to everybody out there. Thanks to Spotify. So thank you everybody. Uh, there's a lot of people watching. So um, just keep clicking that button because we really do appreciate it. Um, yep. It's very what? helpful. One of our teams says all the credit goes to Sharuki, and I yeah. agree. <laughs> always, always said that. Sharuki would agree. <laughs> do, they, do, they sell, do they sell men's clothes where you got that? <laughs> right. He'd see me in a he see me in a colorful cold shirt and say, "Nice shirt, Lambert." They having a sale at the Clown Outlet. <laughs> yep. Hope we could knock you down a peg like like Sharuki. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. Uh, should we maybe try to start getting some questions here, Dave? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Let's see here. Gary, you want to find one? And I will do the same while you're finding something. Okay, yeah. This is this is a good question. This is from uh, my friend Corey, who's a very, very learned deadhead and blogger. Does the uh, Lost Live Dead blog, which is a tremendous, tremendous blog for people who really want to get the deep, great from that story. Um, he wanted to know, about Bobby, about your early influences in country music and specifically – what radio you listen to. And also he wanted to know uh, if you had the opportunity in the sixties to watch uh, the Porter Wagoner TV oh, show okay. or the Buck Owens show. Watch both of them. The Porter Wagoner show more, more than the Buck Owens show. By the time uh, I, Buck Owens got a, his show, Hee Haw, I think it was called on, uh, on TV. Uh, I was already sort of drifting away from TV in general, but uh but Porter Wagner show featured Dolly Parton, and uh, both Jerry and I were were smitten by Dolly Parton. You know, she 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 just uh, she had us wrapped around her little finger, and um, I can't remember the the call letters of the radio station that uh, we used to listen to back here. But uh, Jerry and I were particularly uh, big fans of uh, of Buck Owens early on. Uh, Buck Owens and the Buckaroos, and um, and you know George Jones and 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 uh, we were country music fans. We you know we we grew up on that stuff uh, when when we were kids. It was it was all over the radio in California, and um, I don't know that it's well known, but uh, you know we were we were right there. We we followed it. Until it took a kind of a turn, um, there was after the after the late seventies, when all the the mega producers, uh, the the, uh, um, the guys who made uh, all the hits for you know the big Hollywood stars, um, the big L.A. sound um, that sort of vanished and uh, and. Uh, and those guys were kind of out of work, and so they all moved to Nashville, mm-hmm. and uh, and then country music became this uh, you know this hugely uh, uh, complex complex uh, you know it was uh, over orchestrated and all that kind of stuff, and uh, it became something that it hadn't been, and I, I kind of lost interest, and at the same time. Um, in Nashville, it's kind of well known that uh, if you, uh, you you have to play you have to play the game in Nashville. Uh, 
it's uh you hear a lot of the Nashville uh, uh, people sort of uh, complaining about it. Where uh, you know you, you can't write your own stuff. They have uh, they have what they call the, the Nashville mafia or whatever. Um, the uh, the people who uh, the industry they have the songwriters, they have the uh, the talent uh, people, and all that kind of stuff. And they bring this, the talent and the, the songwriters together. And, uh, and the, here's a kid from, uh, from, uh, from, oh, you know, Ohio or, or Seattle or somewhere who uh, uh, spends a lot of time in the gym. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and they teach him, they give him a coach and they teach him to speak in a, in a, a pretty dismal Southern accent. And they uh, they write they get a team of writers who write songs about serial monog monogamy and uh, and uh, and uh, self abuse and uh, and you got uh, you got a hit <laughs> and um, and that's kind of how it's done and if you don't play that game um, then uh, you can go look for work somewhere else and. Um, you hear people complaining about that a lot. There are people, of course, who rise above that in, in Nashville, in country music. And, but, you know, a huge, a huge uh, preponderance of uh, country music is, is, uh, is suffered from, uh, from those two uh, factors. And so kind of lost interest in, in, in where country music was going after a while you know i'm a classicist by nature and and uh and i like the old stuff yeah although you know it's it's kind of it's it's it explains in a way why you and garcia gravitated toward bakersfield instead of nashville and right. also and also then later the stuff that started coming out of austin was very yep. much much kinfolk to the grateful dead mm -hmm. yeah we could talk about this one subject the whole time, but uh, I want I want to let people know we are going 15 minutes longer. We've been ending these things at 8:30 to go to the video. We are on till 8:45 with Bobby because we knew there'd be a lot of interest. So uh, let's jump on to another question. What do you got, David? Um, well, uh, interest is extremely high in Dead and Company these days. Obviously, uh, you guys are playing big venues, selling a lot of tickets, and people are really psyched on your tours. But the question came up, um, we're not going to shows, uh, has there been any talk of Dead & Company ever writing and getting into the studio? And whether it's reinterpreting Grateful Dead classics in the studio or new stuff, uh, any chance of Dead & Company hitting the studio for a recording session? Well, I'll just say that I'd love to. You know, I, I'd really love to. And, and I, think, uh, I think most of us would. But there are some impediments that I can't really wade into right now. Um, and, uh, and we'll just keep hammering away at them. Right. Well, until then, then when we get back to a uh, live shows, we'll see you on the road for sure. All right. That'll be fun. Um, Gary, you got one? Uh, yeah, th th this is a, I think this one, all of us could take a swing at, um, what do you think was one of the more unappreciated Grateful Dead songs? You know, one that maybe didn't have a long enough life on stage or the audience wasn't crazy about, or that, Maybe never, never found his full potential. Huh. Uh, Jog my memory. Well, I'll, if I could offer one, I never thought, believe it or not, got enough development. And that, speaking back to the country thing, that was something I, the first time I heard that song, I said, Hunter's got to get this song to George Jones. Because mm -hmm. <laughs> that's, that's a George Jones song if I, ever I heard one. Uh, but there were some songs that had a very short life in The Grateful Dead. Uh, O'Teal brought back If I Had the World to Give a couple of years ago. Only three performance of, of that by The Grateful Dead. And yeah. that's the song that I, it's one of my favorite songs from Shakedown Street. And uh, the three live dead performances from 1978, Wonderful and O'Teal, thankfully it brought it back. But I would agree with that one. That was a song that uh, for whatever reason got dropped quickly. I thought personally Lost Sailor, Got dropped too quickly. It was only in the repertoire seven years by the Grateful Dead, and that's a personal favorite. Um, a huge Lost Sailors and a Circumstance fan. Yeah, well, you know it's it's back up now. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's good. Here. It's good to see uh, Dead and Company picking up some of those. Yeah, likewise Weather Report and so yeah. Right. The problem with those two, the last two that you mentioned, is like you know I 
for a while, I got into uh, writing complicated songs, mm -hmm. and uh, <laughs> it, it, it they weren't easy to learn and all that kind of stuff. And, and the guys just didn't put time in. You know, I I, I should have taken uh, taken my uh, I should have taken my tools as seriously as the medium. <laughs> You know, a, a flip side of this question is something else that came up is, do you have a favorite Grateful Dead song when it uh, when it shows up on the set list and you, tonight's the night to play it. Is there one that you get particularly, I know Deadhead certainly do, but are there songs that you get particularly excited about playing that you want to get into? You know, um, people have been asking, asking me that question for at least 40 years. And uh, and I've come uh, about thirty years ago. I came to the realization that uh, you know, as soon as I have a favorite song, it's gonna it's <laughs> another one's gonna shoot it out of the water. And uh, and it's you know, if there's a song that I've been waiting for for you know for a couple of weeks and it finally shows up on this on the set list, it's almost always you know, and I'm just raring to go with it. It's almost always for one reason or another gonna turn out flat at least that evening whereas another one on the set list that uh, I, I I you know I could have cared less is going to sit up and big mm -hmm. and, uh, and uh, <laughs> so I, I, I long ago given up uh, any any notion of, uh, of or any expectations whatsoever I just you know I just go on and uh, let's see what they have to say mm -hmm. right this this might be an interesting one, Bob. Uh, let me see. The gentleman's name is uh, Jacob, and he noted that you have cited the late great McCoy Tyner, who left us recently, uh, as an influence, uh, a great piano player influencing your guitar style. And he wants to know if if McCoy's playing on the John Coltrane tune Tunji specifically <laughs> it, 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 it influenced you. I think I know the answer. <laughs> Yeah. They say that all art is clever theft, and uh, and there, there there's a, a perfect perfect example of it. that. I, I've used that uh, the uh, the what they call the vamp, um, you know, basically the carpet that you build the song off of. Um, I've used that a number of times. Uh, most re you know, I use it. Uh, I use it in uh, in opening. Uh, Trucking, trucking. I, uh, I, I, I use it. Uh, I, I'll throw it into the middle of uh, the other one. Um, and I, and I more recently used it. Uh, used the uh, when I was writing uh, with Willie Dixon. Uh, Eternity, yeah. Eternity. I, I, I used it on that tune. Um, you know, yeah. I first noticed it in Birdsong. You know that ba, ba, that that little. You drop that in there. Uh, yeah. And I think when you played at the Blue Note with Wolf Bros, you actually had both Tunji and Birdsong on the set list. So you were you made the connection a little more explicit. Right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Next question, David. Uh, yeah, there's one that uh, Gary flagged. I think it's a great question. And it is, Bob, you've played. <laughs> I can't think of anybody uh, that you've not played with. Um, at one time or another, but is there any living musician out there that you have not yet played with that you would really love to get on a stage with? People ask me that one all the time too, and uh, I, I'll just take it as it comes. Um, there are endless folks that I'd love to play with. Mm -hmm. uh, well, we, you know, we see it. We'll turn on the internet, and there you'll be on stage with Paul McCartney or whoever it is, and it just it seems to be a quite a frequent occurrence in your life. Yeah, you know. It's it's a lot of fun. Good. You had a hell of a night in Nashville not long ago with yeah. Wolf Bros, where the stage was just an endless parade of amazing people. Margot Price, I mean Lou Harris, uh, I can't even remember who else, but a, a real great lineup. Yeah, a bunch of bunch of great folks there on that to yeah. on that show. Yeah. Uh, well, here's a question that's actually related to the thing about TRI. Uh, uh, Steve wants to know if there's any chance of your fabulous talk show, We're Here, returning anytime. That's something you could probably do from home, you know, because with, with the way you can hook up with people around the country now. You know, I might do something akin to that. Uh, maybe we'll do that for the couch tour. I'll, uh, I'll, uh, we'll pull 
Steve Parrish and uh, mm -hmm. and uh, let me let me sleep on that. That's a good that's a good that's a good idea. Yeah, as, as David and I learned a few weeks ago, if you want to have a guest that'll minimize your work for the night, bring in, <laughs> bring in Bill Walton because you ask him a simple declarative question and let him take off. <laughs> yeah, Bill, Bill was fun. Um, yeah, definitely uh, a a good guest to have on your show. But yeah, the We're Here shows were were very well received, and I think, as Gary says, with the with the way we can do it now, certainly wouldn't have to leave home. Right. David, you got another? Yeah, you know, um, Gary brought up a very interesting question that someone had asked. Um, Gary, it's the one about uh, the quote from the the uh, the other one documentary. <laughs> Jerry, now Bob, this is this is a, a bit of an involved question. Um, you you once dropped a rock on a kid's head because you basically just wanted to see what would happen. Um, <laughs> And as the question goes, you also have problems with a ghost when you were staying at a cabin in Montana with Barlow. Did you ever think that may have been the ghost of the kid whose head you <laughs> dropped the rock on? I, I've, I've answered, I could ascertain for you that that's, that was not the case because the ghosts that, uh, in, in Wyoming it was uh, were in, in the cabin we were staying. Uh, he, he, had, uh, he had checked out a long, long time ago. Okay. And the, the kid uh, that I dropped the hammer on, it was a little toy hammer, but it uh, rung his bells anyway. I, I just wanted to see if I could hit him. I, I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, uh, but, and, and the kid, the kid lived. He didn't, it wasn't. Oh, yeah, yeah, he was, you know, a little <laughs> toy hammer. He didn't, you know, I, I don't think he concussed or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, uh, let me just say uh, that I admire the fact that you answered that question without an attorney present. <laughs> um, here's a good one. A uh, guy named John says, Bob, I came across early live stuff where you sang lead on Dire Wolf. And he wants to know if that song was intended for you to sing originally or was Jerry too busy on the pedal steel and just handed it off to you for those early live performances? Uh, pretty much that, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, when, when uh, w of course, in the studio, Jerry could play pedal steel and then overdub the vocal. Right, yeah. And, uh, and then live, it just became a, an electric guitar tune, so yeah, um, more acoustic in the acoustic sense. Yeah, that, that makes sense. I would imagine if he'd stuck, uh, if he, I think we actually played a gig or two when he, when he trotted out the pedal steel. I, I'm not, I may or may, or may not be wrong, uh, right about this uh, or wrong about this, uh, but I think he tried pedal steel with the Grateful Dead a time or two, and uh, yeah. and uh, and then consigned it to the you know the dustbin of history. Um, but if if uh, if he had uh, stuck with the pedal steel, he probably would have uh, bequeathed me a number of, of the tunes that uh, he did with that he played pedal steel on. Yeah, he indeed he indeed played pedal steel live with the Dead for a good part in 1969 before he had the New Riders as an outlet for his steel playing. Right. Uh, and and he once he w once was asked why he dropped pedal steel and he said that would take me a whole other lifetime to learn to play properly. But mm -hmm. I think the record shows he played played it pretty damn well given the amount of time he spent on it. Uh, he used to say that you have to be a a mechanic, a, a musician, a mechanic, and a physicist to uh, to play the. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that's amazing uh, what else we got what else on the queue for questions Bob do, uh, is there anything that you want to talk about that's not a question I know you've talked about all the things keeping you busy but uh, you know one question I did see is uh, are you listening to anything current um, a, a zoom party asked that question um, and do you have any recommendations if you've heard anything recently, whether it's current music or something old, but something that's right in your head right now that you're digging that you want to share? Well, you know, that's a good question to ask me toward the end of the summer on a normal summer when I've been playing, uh, when I've been playing festivals. Because when I, when I play festivals, I, I hear a lot of uh, bands. I don't listen to a lot of radio. Mm -hmm. And... Um, and or, or or records though I'm starting to listen to records again now but uh, but you know I, I, I kind of get most of my music live mm -hmm. and uh, 
when I when I go out and uh, I sort of do the hired gun thing at festivals and 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 play with a, a number of bands, um, I, I I I pick up some favorites. Uh, now I can't remember a single one of them. <laughs> you should have uh, given me that question twenty minutes before we went on. <laughs> next, next, next time we'll give you some prep. Yeah. This is this is a pretty profound question from Lewis. Uh, do you feel the muse of Garcia while you were singing his songs, and which ones have you felt have started to become your own? Um. On a given night, I'll, I'll answer those in reverse order. Uh, on a given night, um, they never become my own. Uh, they never were Jerry's. You know, our, our songs aren't ours. They're, uh, they're, they, those songs belong to the characters in them. Mm -hmm. But then on a given night, um, sometimes when I, when I do my job right and, and and lose myself, forget myself, and and uh, and let the the character really step into my shoes. Um, yeah, that's when I that's that's when I'm feeling it. And uh, do I feel it, Jerry's muse? Well, I think on those occasions that I just uh, that I just described, then um, I think that's when I feel his muse because I feel what was directing him when he was write, writing those songs. It's, it's a matter of the, those characters. You know, songs are a living thing. Mm -hmm. a, a song is a living thing. And, uh, and, uh, and it comes into our world from whatever, whatever parallel universe that, the, that they, uh, they exist freely in. Mm -hmm. and, um, and the muse is you know, the muse sort of uh, facilitates that, I guess. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so she's uh, she's doing her deal and uh, and she's making making the arrangements, uh, making, you know, greasing this kid so that this guy can pop through or this character can pop through to uh, to our world. And I'm not sure that she's real particular mm -hmm. about who is a. Uh, who is doing the writing, who's doing the singing, who's doing the playing, any of that. Um, I think she just wants to get the job done. And, uh, and so, yeah, I, I, I think I, you know, I, I, on, a, on occasion, I think I, I really can feel Jerry's muse uh, um, at work, actively at work, not just passively uh, or, you know, in the past, yeah. but actively at work, uh, uh, you know, scooting this, uh, scooting this character or that through, uh, you know, in a, in a given song, there could be, a, a, you know, a, aside from the main character in the song, there might be another character that steps up, for instance. Yeah. Well, also, as the players age, the so the stories become different. You know, I, I now, think I think of Jerry singing Warfrat when he was in his twenties. Yeah. You know, and, and he was like sort of putting on the cloak of this old man, mm -hmm. uh, and and by the end of his run, he was he was much more that guy. And when I hear you do a song like "Days Between," like the depth of experience is really mm -hmm. very profound in that song. I've I've been loving the way you've been doing "Days Between." Okay. Uh, well, listen, we, it's time to wind things up. Uh, yeah. This, this has flown by. We could have gone to nine o'clock. Let's make a note well, of that for next time. I've seen the numbers fly by, and uh, this is by far um, the recordest, record setting night that we've done here. So, Bob, uh, it's your presence here that I think has brought so many people in. So, thank you. Thanks, Spotify, for doubling everything that's getting donated. And thank you for donating. Um, it's really appreciated. You have no idea. This money really does help. And so, thank you. And thanks, Spotify. And thank you, Bob. And we've got a great show next week, 1991. And we've pulled a lot of shows from the archive uh, just yesterday for the next few weeks. So we've got a lot of stuff that you've never seen before. So, And let's, let's let people know that you can keep on donating as the show unrolls for the next few hours. Uh, and, and you can go out to as well. That's right. And to get to the show, it's on a different screen. So if you look below your YouTube screen and look at the info area, you will click on a different link. Bobby, you can't see that. That's, somewhat, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> you click on that link and that will take you right around now 
to 1989 in Foxborough. Bobby, thank you so much. Love to Natasha and the girls. We hope to see you very soon in person or this way, whichever way. Whatever way. Thank you, Bobby. Thank Good night, you. everybody. Enjoy Good the night. Show. Bye, Gary. All right. Bye.